subtrochanteric femoral fractures. This is from the OTA Resident Core Curriculum Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Brandon Yuan, and I'm Saqib Rahman narrating. And this is the third and final video in this slide deck. We already talked about anatomy, deforming forces in the first video, and then we focused a lot about technique in the second video, uh, reduction techniques, um, positioning techniques, implant uh, placement techniques in order to avoid malreductions. And in this last video, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, controversies and some clinical applications. So let's get into it. So when would a nail maybe not work? Um, well, maybe if there's a lot of comminution of the nail starting point at the tip of the greater trochanter or piriformis fossa. Um, plates are still an option. A uh, 95 degree blade plate, for example, is an option. Um, you can go to otaonline.org, and if you're a member, you can access some really high quality videos, such as use of the 95 degree angled blade plate to treat a high energy proximal femur fracture. So you may want to check that out. Reference um, for this is also shown uh, in the uh, footnote below. Um, you also have proximal femoral locking plates, right? So these are plates designed really for subtrochanteric femur fractures. Uh, this fracture here is a little bit more of a um, you know, intertrochanteric fracture, I would argue, with comminution. Uh, but there are proximal femoral locking plates that are meant to be alternatives to the blade plate for example. So a little bit easier to apply and put together uh, and essentially create a fixed angle construct. So um, so when, well, when else would a nail not work? Well, um, if you have revision fixation with a poor starting point. So here you can see this malreduction uh, with varus. Uh, what you can't notice here as well is there's some flexion. Uh, prior nails in place, and it's really going to be tough to just revise this with a nail alone, right? So here you can see the nail is removed. Uh, you can see that there's a very lateral starting point and nail path, right? So uh, just correcting varus with another nail in this very short segment, it's going to be really difficult. I mean, you've got all this bone loss between here and here. So just throwing in like a blocking screw, for instance, might not really be enough. So in this case, uh, the old starting point is bone grafted, uh, the lag screw path is bone grafted, and then a plate is used to uh, correct the varus. And then really important, when you are using plates, that you get compression as much as possible. Uh, we talked about this in the first video, how you have significant tensile stresses in the lateral cortex. So you have to do everything possible to compress um, these fractures. Sometimes you can use the um, articulating tensioning device even to get substantial compression across the fracture when you fix these with a plate. Clinical application. So um, here is an example of an atypical femoral fracture. So we talked about this in the first video. So this is from Rockwood and Green, and you can see how uh, with uh, when you take a look at this fracture, it's a short oblique subtrochanteric femur. And if you look carefully, you will see the care, not drawing it as well as I would like. You can see this characteristic beaking here. Okay. So instead of the cortex being like this, you can see there's this beak here. Okay. And that is because there was probably a stress fracture developing here. And due to the uh, abnormal remodeling that happens when you're on prolonged bisphosphonates and osteoclasts are blocked for years and years, um, you can develop these stress fractures in the subtrochanteric region and develop uh, eventually a complete fracture through there. So this is a patient that might present maybe with prodromal pain, and then maybe they just get up and stand the wrong way and all of a sudden their femur breaks. So obviously they're going to fall. So you have to backtrack a little bit and say, okay, you fell. Did you trip and fall? Did you lose consciousness and fall? And they may tell you like, well, I my leg gave out and then I fell because of that. Well, then you have to look really carefully at the x-rays, look at their medical history. Have they been on bisphosphonates for a long period of time? And then you may identify 
hey, it's a short oblique, there's some beaking, history is, is looks like it's pointing towards this, and that may be what you're dealing with. I mean, there's really no good diagnostic or lab test you can get to, to test for this. So uh, here, you know, what you can see in this image is um, patients not fully fractured, but you can see that there's that lateral cortical thickening or beaking. And a lot of times when patients get these over time, they will also get some bowing. And you can see that here, a little bit of bowing of the proximal femur. Um, and if you, you know, if you were to imagine, you know, going in with a, with an intramedullary nail coming straight down, you can see it's sort of, you know, there is some bowing there. Um, so this can happen with the stress factors developing over a period of time and then remodeling. And um, so likely you're getting a stress fracture that's occurring in this abnormal bone because of prolonged bisphosphonates and osteoclast blocking. Um, remodeling suppression is taking place that occurs with these bisphosphonates, puts the femur at risk for uh, decreasing healing of these smaller stress fractures that eventually can lead to, uh, you know, the atypical complete femur fracture seen in the last slide. So um, atypical subtrochanteric and diaphyseal femoral fra fractures. Uh, this is a report from the task force from the ASBMR, right? So um, what they said is that the fracture's got to be located in the femoral diaphysis just distal to the lesser trochanter and just proximal to the supracondylar flare. So anywhere along that area, uh, but you have to have um, four or five major features. And uh, although none of the minor features are required, you'll sometimes see those as well. So let's go through these. So major features, you need four of these. Minimal or no trauma. Fracture line originates at the lateral cortex and is transverse. I mean, it can be somewhat short oblique. There is a medial spike. There's usually minimal or no comminution. And then you'll see that beaking, which is that localized periosteal reaction and thickening that's at the fracture site. And if you don't, don't look carefully, you might miss that. Minor features are increased cortical thickness of the diaphysis, prodromal symptoms, bilateral incomplete or complete fractures of the diaphysis, delayed fracture healing. So if you look really carefully, and you may have to zoom in on your screen, you will see right here that there is a stress fracture. There's some beaking. There is a very faint lucency there. Here you can see beaking, if you look very carefully. And you often have to check the contralateral side when a patient presents with this because they may have a complete fracture on the one side and then you look at the other side and they have a fracture that looks like it's about to happen at some point. So you occasionally have to consider a prophylactic fixation of the contralateral side. So because there's abnormal bone metabolism to begin with, um, there is a disruption of normal bone remodeling. These have somewhat slower healing rates. Um, and because of that, or probably because of that, they're less tolerant to varus. So, you know, as little as five, as little as five degrees of varus can lead to failure. Um, so you really have to be even more careful about... Um, your uh, reduction and fixation, as we talked about in the last video. And here you can see severus reduction, probably could have been better, and uh, goes on to hardware failure. So I talked about how with this constant like stress fractures and remodeling that you can get this bowing. Uh, well, you can also get, you know, some anterior bowing. And if you have an older generation nail that has a larger radius of curvature, you can get this sort of perforation of a long nail distally. So be careful. Get a lateral x-ray when you put your guide rod, uh, rod in. Um, look very carefully as you put the rod in distally, the implant, that you're not causing this. And uh, it is difficult to preoperatively template for this. But if you're using newer generation nails that have you know, a smaller radius of curvature, they're more likely to end up a little more posteriorly. So this has been addressed to some extent with implant design. And there are a few other ways to avoid this. 
So as I mentioned before, look for contralateral stress fractures. Again, they may not present with an all-out fracture, but stress fracture might be seen. And this can be pretty high, 28 to 53% of cases. And this was in a, a paper by Dr. Uh, uh, Bogdan in JOT 2016. Expect very slow healing times. So um, caution your patients. Um, you know, you're going to need potentially long follow-up. And oftentimes we'll ask the medical doctors to give them a prolonged holiday or stop the bisphosphonates um, and consider potentially other agents because these are going to be slow. So a lot of times you may have to engage an endocrinologist um, if you're not comfortable managing that primarily uh, in these patients. All right, so let's summarize everything. So the anatomy and understanding the deforming forces is really important here. The unique muscular and mechanical forces through the subtrochanteric region have significant implications for fracture reduction and fixation. Remember um, that sort of asymmetry of um, compression and tension in the subtrochanteric region, a lot of stress in that area. Uh, Starting point and trajectory is really important. You want to start medially. You want to aim laterally. All right. You don't want to do the opposite. You don't want to start here and aim here. Uh, if you have geriatric patients, you really got to consider fixing up into the uh, proximal femur, uh, meaning into the femoral head. Comminution of the starting point might be a relative in indication to use a plate. Uh, and also, if you have to revise something with very bad starting points, you may need to consider uh, revision to a plate as well. Atypical femur fractures have these sort of major and minor characteristics you have to look for. Uh, and remember, they may occur with very minimal trauma, kind of like a pathological fracture. And the atypical femur fractures have much prolonged healing time. You got to look at the contralateral side. You have to remember there may be some bowing in the femur itself because of the stress fractures that have been potentially occurring and trying to heal over time. All right, so that ends our slide deck on subtrochanteric femoral fractures. Thank you.